Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hello, everybody. Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Listen Up Hearing Center. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so that they can remain better connected with their family and remain independent. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing loss is because I lost my brother, Avi, twice. First to a hearing loss from radiation to his brain tumor, and then again when he passed away. I only care for ears. I'm the E of ENT. I've performed over 10,000 ear surgeries in my career, taking care of many more patients with hearing loss. I'm the founder of Listen Up Hearing Center. I'm also an author of the book of the same name, Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more about that, go to listenuphearing.com. That's listenuphearing.com. Today, I have a great, interesting uh, guest. It's Dr. David Akbari. He attended the Berkeley College of Music and then obtained his AUD degree from the University of Minnesota. He's a key opinion leader and advocate for evidence-based practices. He's the chairman of the work group formulated for hearing aid prescription standards. He'll give us the alphabet soup and the numbers that correlate with that. He serves on the editorial advisory board for the Hearing Review, as well as the Academy of Doctors of Audiology Task Force on Over-the-Counter Hearing Aids. He's also the, currently the head of audiology at Intracon, and we'll talk about that more. David, thank you so much for your time coming on to listen up. This is great to have you as a guest. It's great to be with you. So uh, just, you know, obviously uh, I get it, but uh, when you went to Berkeley College of Music, um, what did you study at Berkeley? Oh, that's a great question. So when I went to Berkeley, you know, like many people that go there, they tend to think, boy, you know, I want to be a rock star. I want to be somebody that uh, really makes a living in music. But you are a rock ended- star just in audio. yeah, I suppose, <laughs> I suppose. But what really attracted me at Berkeley was the curriculum involving music synthesis was the, the degree program I did at the time, which, you know, synthesis is the idea of making something from nothing. And what really got me into acoustics and um, sort of vibration as a, as a physical phenomenon was this idea of mathematical models of sound and how you could not only make uh, different sounds in the environment, either mimicking natural sounds or creating totally new sounds, but we also really explored in the curriculum how do you make alternative controllers for musical performance? So for example, what kind of a gesture makes something feel musical? The idea of like faded in vibrato or something like that, where it's, it's absolutely artificial, but it makes you feel like it's real or it's a real human performing that gesture. What is faded in vibrato for the... So it sounds like this. Ah... Uh... It right. sounds like you, you start flat and then it goes, ah, oh, you start to add in vibrato and vi- violin players do this, vocalists use it. It's just generally considered a musical technique. So if you're creating a synthesizer from nothing, being able to add that in is something that sort of gives you those chops of making something musical. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, just as a side, I was at a, a, a wedding this past weekend and there was a guy playing music at a, the, the hotel I was staying at. And he basically, you could tell he was recording each part track of the playing live. He would record one track for about 30 seconds, then the next track for 30 seconds. And then by the time he had warmed up the song for about two and a half minutes, he had four, five tracks playing simultaneously, plus his live track on vocal. So I, 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 that might be a simplistic, but it sounds like that's type of uh, technique you're talking about. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, the stuff I worked on was much more boring than that. You know, I was writing software for other people to make music essentially at the time. Uh, and I was actually living in, in Hollywood, California, when I kind of decided to go back to graduate school. And I was like, you know, I could really help people with this knowledge instead of use it to enrich myself. Well, hopefully both. Hopefully yeah. both. <laughs> and so that actually leads into it. So you decided to pursue an AUD degree, correct? Yes, sir. And so was that out of that concept of hearing or is that the uh, genesis of it? Yeah. You know, what was really interesting at the time is that the compositions I was making, including, you know, really a turning point for me was the year 2007. I was commissioned by the then head of uh, curation at the Carnegie Hall in New York City. And they, I was working with a guy named Michael Rhodes, and he commissioned me to do some sort of soundscape kind of comp- classical computer music. Uh, for performance in the Young Composer series. And, you know, I, I was working on that kind of stuff. And I thought, you know, we're, I'm cultivating such a deep understanding of the phenomenon surrounding 
um, vibration as a physical phenomenon, you know, vibration as it exists in the universe. But what if I could enhance my knowledge by understanding how that affects the human body? Like, how do we understand hearing? And that led me to a uh, study of hearing science, the clinical applications of hearing loss, like how do people, when they lose their hearing, what happens? You know, so things like, uh, you know, the widening of the cochlear filters or the physiological tuning curves and things like that. And all those great hearing science concepts. I had no knowledge of that at the time, but I knew I wanted to learn it, you know, if that makes sense. Like, you, you don't know what you know un until you, you know a little bit. And then you realize, wow, I have so much yet to know. Yeah. And psychoacoustics as, as well. I assume. Absolutely. I mean, they talk about that in music, right? I mean, they talk about psychoacoustics all the time, but it's sort of poorly defined, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that's actually fair enough, right? It's kind of a big bucket that different people uh, put different stuff into. I actually think it's an underappreciated part of hearing by one of the most underappreciated parts of hearing. Oh, definitely. Yeah, so, so that leads you, you get your AUD degree, and then where do you go? So, you know, as I was doing the AUD degree, I sort of was distinct from a lot of my peers who wanted to sort of just go into hospitals and work in clinical practice. I really early on wanted to be in the industry because it really was a good fit for me synthesizing what I learned um, about um, sound, the science of sound and everything. And also, you know, what I could do in terms of product development. I mean, that's really the kind of stuff I was doing at the time was writing software for other musicians to use to create, you know, like Hollywood films, for example. And I thought, well, you know, I have all these great ideas about directionality and um, speech in noise or even music in noise, like sound source separation kinds of ideas. And like, wouldn't it be amazing if I could implement that on a very low power body worn device, such as a hearing aid. And that's kind of what led me to seeking out a company who would, would allow me to pursue that passion. And that's where I found Intracon Corporation. All right. Well, uh, as you we were saying in the warm up, um, uh, it's it's a very interesting name, but it's not totally descriptive. In other words, you know. So what 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 do you do for Intracon, and what does Intracon do? Yeah. Okay. So uh, maybe I start with what Intracon does. So Intracon is a medical device manufacturer. Unlike a lot of medical device manufacturers related to hearing aids, they don't just make hearing aids. So hearing health is one of the key parts of the business, but they also make uh, diabetes monitoring devices for a company called Medtronic. Uh, Intracon also makes uh, surgical navigation and electromagnetic tip location sensors uh, to assist in certain types of surgery, as well as um, what's called the chocolate balloon catheter, which is a, it's a type of catheter that's drug coated uh, and is allowed to be used for certain therapies and interventions um, in that way. And so hearing health is just part of the product portfolio. And what I've done at Intracon is I've been there over 10 years now. And for the first, I want to say nine or so years, I was in an R&D capacity, the research and development. And uh, my brain just really loves that stuff. I just love research and development. Um, but since there's been all this brouhaha about OTC or over-the-counter hearing aids, it, I, over the last couple of years, I've actually transitioned into a regulatory role. Uh, so that's what I'm doing today is I'm working more on the regulatory side to ensure compliance worldwide for testing the hearing aids and the standards. And that's kind of what, you know, sort of fell in my lap was the, you know, being the chairman of this working group on doing the standards for prescription hearing aids, as well as being a, a sincere advocate for getting the policy prescription right on OTC hearing aids. So forgive me, David, go ahead and please give the formal I mean, I was kind of making light because it's a it's a, a, a quite a, a, a committee name. But go ahead, if you would, give the formal name of the committee that you're working on standards for prescriptive hearing aids. Oh, sure. OK, so it is a committee. The formal name is ANSI slash ASA, which stands for American National Standard Institute and the Acoustical Society of America. And it's it's a group called S3, which is bioacoustics working group 48. So it fits into a broader scheme with the S series. So like there's S1, S2, but S3 really is bioacoustics. And there's actually a subgroup called animal bioacoustics, which I'm not involved in. Um, but the bioacoustics group uh, is the, the bucket with which we're under. And it comprises quite a large and diverse thought leadership group among the industry. In fact, we just had our meeting last week in Seattle, uh, peripheral to the AAA show. And uh, I think there was 42 people from 18 countries um, oh. that were, were joining. And, and they were all there really to help the American policy prescription 
um, both in terms of, you know, where we need to go in terms of the standards and the measurements, but also um, in terms of actually sussing out the details. So for example, a lot of these people had concerns about certain aspects of the, the OTC hearing aid final rule. Others uh, wanted to discuss the technical details of doing good testing and keeping in mind that the, the, the tests that a lot of clinicians use to determine whether a hearing aid's good or not is what's called ANSI S322. And it's those 2cc coupler tests uh, for QC or for quality control. Um, and that's a really flagship standard, a really important standard for prescription hearing aids, as you mentioned. Right. And so what's the overall charge of the committee? Like what, when, when the committee or if it uh, you know, comes to fruition in terms of its first standards, what, what area of uh, clinical practice, you know, getting kind of where the rubber meets the road, will that kind of uh, apply to or cover? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. It actually will affect every single hearing aid that's sold in the United States, period. So, for example, with the OTC hearing aids, there is another standard called ANSI CTA, which is this Consumer Technology Association, and their standard is 2051. And it's historically been considered sort of quote unquote PSAP standard, right. personal sound amplification product standard, but it's been repurposed by the FDA to be used for. Uh, the OTC hearing aid rule. And the reason for that is it's got criterion referenced values in there. So for example, it says you can't have a hearing aid more than 120 dB SPL, which is that peak OSPL 90. If you look at the standard, it actually references ANSI S322 all, all, all throughout. Uh, so it's, what's interesting is that th there are two different purposes. It's the CTA is meant for a criterion reference value. And the S322 does not include performance criterion because it's meant for the manufacturers to set their own. And typically what happens is they'll do a statistical distribution uh, and figure out min, max, nominal kinds of things there. So to answer your question, it affects every single hearing aid that's sold in the United States. Okay. And so how does it affect it? In other words, so to the common person, like, okay, so you've got these standards. What does like, so you give the standards to the manufacturers, what does that affect or how does that affect them? Oh, sure. So it, it does a few different things. So the first thing it does is it creates a method that's reproducible to test a hearing aid, period, you know, like just to test it. Like, so you there's all sorts of performance or to test its integrity. Both. Oh, uh, so sure. so the, the, if you think about the words and the, and the word we like to use is quality control, because it, it does both like the performance aspects. How does it perform? What's the gain? What's the output? And the integrity is something wrong with it. You know, it, right. it, you know, it's a way to, to assess if a part's dead. And it's actually a common test that clinicians will use when they order a hearing aid for a patient to see, is it, is it working coming out of the factory or is it defective? That's a really common use of it. Um, so it's intended to be a test method that's reproducible uh, and manufacturers are allowed to set their own tolerance. That's kind of the key thing with S322 um, and key and a distinct feature of the OTC rule. You mean determine whether what percentage of their manufactured hearing aids need to meet it to consider them within standards or? That's one aspect. And then the other is on any individual measurement, what is the pass fail criterion more or less? Meaning this hearing aid in particular passes or fails. So exactly. That's why it's quality control. So it's, these are manufacturing standards in terms of what, to, how often can it not meet the standards and what are those standards that they should meet? But they set them themselves in terms of what percentage they have to meet. Is that correct? That's right. And typically that's the result of what we call an operational qualification or OQ test. And you basically, you manufacture 30 hearing aids or something, you test them all and you plot a distribution and then you sort of call the tails, the min and max, and then the median is the, um, is the nominal or, or, or similar. I mean, other manufacturers have different ways of doing it, but. This is an interesting concept. So what would cause, so, you know, I mean, honestly, um, from a, let's say from a consumer electronic point of view, we pretty much expect each iPhone to do the same thing, right? right? And on occasion, maybe there's a short in one or something from a manufacturer, but by and large, you know, an iPhone is an iPhone is an iPhone, right? And That's so right. from a hearing aid point of view, what would lead to variability within a 30 different hearing aids being manufactured? This is, I mean, I, I don't know enough about the manufacturing process, so it's kind of an interesting question. It's a very interesting question. And the answer to the question is, when you're designing and manufacturing a hearing aid, oftentimes what you'll do is you'll outsource certain specific components, like the receiver, for example, which counterintuitively does not receive sounds, but produces those sounds. Right. It's really what, is what I tell patients. It's a speaker. That's right. And the idea is if you- from the processor. 
it's receiving a signal from the processor. That's right. And it's, it's functioning as a speaker. Right. What happens is if you buy those components from another supplier, there is inherent variability in the component itself. And so when you're combining different components, you're sort of adding those sources of variability together. And so when you have the final finished product, you might have a little variability from the receiver, a little variability from the microphone, and those, those tiny amounts of, of variability add up in the manufacturing process. It could be something like two, three dB or more uh, uh. across a spread. And it's enough to say, oh my goodness, you know, somebody could hear that or it's a difference. And typically it's well controlled in manufacturing situation because they'll, they'll open them up and they'll figure out, well, what is it? So this measure correlate, for example, you know, total harmonic distortion might correlate to uh, resonance phenomena in the instrument. You know, you'll have the, it's really tiny and it's kind of rattling around and, and you got to figure out it, you know, maybe you need to isolate it or there's, it, it relates to the design as well as the component selection. But, and so correct me if I'm wrong, there aren't a lot. So the speaker microphone side or microphone and receiver side, there aren't a lot, like by and large, there are a couple of manufacturers of both. Is that correct? That's right. Yep. There's not a, hu a huge amount of them. That's right. So how many microphone manufacturers are there out there? Oh my goodness. I couldn't tell you offhand. I mean, I, I got to believe there's people, less, than, right? less than 10 for sure. I mean, I'm aware of like the big ones like Knowles and Sony on and, and, and those. Uh, there's perhaps several more. Um, and then uh, how about on the receiver side? There are only a couple of those as it's well. about the same, yeah. You know, and, and it just depends. I mean, the, the technology hasn't really changed that much. You know, it's these little membranes that, that vibrate. You've got MEMS microphones and other things that are um, more encapsulated, more rigid surface kinds of things for small embodiments uh, with their own power supplies and so on. But to your point, yeah, there's there's not many. I think the, the biggest differentiator is a lot of the big manufacturers are molding their own RICs and making their own receiver units and so on nowadays. Um, you know, but that's not as typical as we might think. And so and interestingly, because, you know, when you think about the, 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 the brains or the DSP, that by and large should have, that's the, like kind of the iPhone equivalent, right? You would that's expect right. That, but the same output. It's actually the parts that the manufacturer puts on their chip that actually determines the performance. Exactly. Or variability in performance, I should say. Sure, sure. All right. That's, that's really fascinating. And so the... Um, the, the 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 work group is to give the standards that then the manufacturer, I assume the manufacturers have a, a, a seat at the table as well in terms of giving input for this. Exactly. The manufacturers do as well as the FDA. Uh, uh -huh. They sit on there, um, representatives from the, the world. So there's people from, you know, I, I want to use the example of Germany without naming names. Uh, you know, the guy that runs the major test house over there. Uh, in order to sell products into Germany, I mean, you've got to go through oh, his test the house. Regulatory environment, right? Yep, exactly. And, you know, there's everybody's got a seat at the table. And I would, you know, add to your listening audience, it's free to join. There's no requirement other than that you're willing to participate. Right. Um, and it's it's very formal. I mean, it's conducted in a very formal way such that there's a gavel procedure and, you know, we, we gavel resolutions and, you know, call to order and so on. Um, okay, and so the other thing that you mentioned that you're uh, so uh, involved in is, uh, you know, you were on the, maybe still are the Academy of Doctors of Audiology Task Force and over, over the counter hearing aid. So that's on the other side between prescriptive and over the counter, correct? Yeah, it's actually mostly focused at the time was focused on the over the counter stuff directly. The, the idea being that they wanted to provide inputs to the FDA as part of the comment period to get the best possible outcome for the independent audiologists or those who are seeking autonomy of practice. Right. Okay. And so that, that, that I, I assume to some extent that's come to a culmination, right? In other words, the rules are out. And then if there's a revision, it would go and try to help with a revision. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. It's a, it, what, it's a really great group and it was separated in terms of like technical aspects versus like the public policy and licensure aspects and so on. And, you know, kudos to the ADA for really recognizing the need to go about uh, forming the task force and then issuing the comments and opinions to help shape the public policy outcomes. Yeah, so now just kind of stepping back, I mean, because it sounds like you're um, really involved in a lot of this just through the nature of your positions. Looking at it from kind of a higher elevation, what do you think's happened? And uh, so we're, we're into OTCs. Um, you know, there were some people who would have told you it was like the equivalent of Y2K that, you know, we were going to have all these crashes of all these systems. And in the end, the world just kind of went on. So, you know, kind of what's your take of where things are with all of that right now? Yeah, that, that's such a great question. And I, I really appreciate you asking that. You know, my take on it is that 
there was a lot of time, talent, and treasure on the debate over OTC spent on the issue of output and gain. And really, you know, when you're going through the process of getting these OTC products on the market, they look at output and gain, they say, well, that's great, but tell us about the wireless performance, coexistence, and radiated immunity, and tell us what you're labeling. So it really doesn't ultimately have a lot to do with output and gain. And so what I think has happened, and the work of the standards group has kind of confirmed this, is that they're, the FDA had a really tough job, let's be honest, and kudos to them for, for doing what they did. But on the one hand, they've got the congressional mandate, which is that you have to come up with these set of performance criteria that are going to influence public policy. On the other hand, they've got the industry saying, whoa, 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 this is going to totally disrupt our business models, it's going to cannibalize our existing consumer base, which is the providers, and it's going to cause devastation. So we can't allow this. And so what's happened is, as a result of all that, in the ANSI CTA 2051 standard, there's a couple of measurements that people are concerned about. And I think it's worth going into the detail on that. Sure. Yeah. So the, the first is this distinction that's been added for input versus output distortion. So recall that for the public policy debate, there was a huge uh, amount, like I said, of time, talent, and treasure dedicated to output and gain. And the FDA decided they, they wanted to put a limit on output. They chose 117 peak OSPL90 as that maximum limit in the 2CC coupler. And they chose not to have a gain limit by the, the rules. Well, what actually happens is if you look at the test for input control distortion, you actually have to produce an output, static output of 70 dB, and you have to produce, you know, you have to sort of take the hearing aid way down to get that output. Well, the problem is you're into the noise floor. And if you couple that uh, with the 5% maximum performance criterion, it becomes an implicit gain limitation. And this is something that I'm preparing, uh, you know, to sort of gently or friendly remind the, the FDA, you know, that they chose not to enforce a gain rule, but yet there is one arguably in the final rule that they need to address. Uh, the other one is that people don't realize this, but the OTC hearing aids are actually currently held to a much higher standard than the prescription hearing aids, right. because they actually have a defined set of performance criterion where manufacturers just get to say what the prescription is. So what's happened as a macro result of all this is that we, you know, there was many predictions. I myself have been on several programs making macroeconomic predictions about um, how this will increase access and affordability in a macroeconomic sense by providing more competition, which has a downward effect on price. But what's happening is I think tactically right now, a lot of people are struggling to get through the 510k process because of some of the ambiguity around some of these standard measures. So you're not seeing as many of like the self-fittings and the innovation that you might have expected to see as quickly as we might want to see it. But what I can say is that after OTCs come about, the policy prescription, which was access, meaning people who can't have access to calibrated equipment or who live in rural areas, and also the affordability where, you know, it's a little bit less cost than they might have with a provider with a bundled model, uh, those are actually emerging today. I mean, you're seeing products like the Lexi Lumen uh, powered by Bose. You see, um, you know, a couple of the other ones like the um, New Hira IQ Buds uh, are out there as an OTC product. Uh, there, there's several more. I expect there'll be many, many more as time yeah. goes on and as the public policy increases. But I think Overall, that's what's happening is you're not seeing as much as you might want to see, although I think the goals of the policy prescription are starting to manifest. Yeah, it's interesting because my take is um, access is an issue, but it's really, uh, see, I see them as awareness. I think, you know, um, this will make people much more aware that there is technology that can help them rehabilitate their or treat their hearing loss. And it's kind of an entree product, right? And so- sure. And then you realize, well, some of them will realize, well, if I can get a, a correctly adjusted prescriptive product, I've got a much more likely chance of being satisfied with my ability to hear and communicate. And so that's kind of where I see it going. Well, and that's such an important point too, Mark, that you've got this potential where, where everybody thinks of OTC as this be all end all, but you just hit the nail on the head. I really think it's about providing this effective on-ramp to ongoing care. That sometimes we use the term hyper care that you can get access to your care, your condition may change and that you have, you have those resources to help you. And that it also folds into some sort of an oral rehabilitation program. Things that people aren't billing for necessarily today or aren't really a source of funding, but absolutely affect the public policy and public health outcomes, which is really what this is all about. Right, right. Well, on a macroscopic level, obviously, right? And yeah. you know, so it's like anything, some people 
um, you know, want a bespoke, totally custom product and some don't. And so having, I, I'm not sure they're the same people that, that you're competing for, but it certainly should hopefully give a better name to rehabilitating your hearing loss with hearing technology, be it OTC or prescriptive. Definitely. Well, and that's what I like to tell people is that, you know, much like in the 1970s, when it was seen as potentially unethical for the same person to test the hearing and then dispense the hearing instruments, that now we're in a similar historic moment insofar as that providers are able to decouple themselves from the provision of the care, um, as opposed to being device salespeople. I think yeah, it's a that's, a, I mean, I think that some of that's paradigmatic application, the paradigms that people are self-imposing, right? In other words, um, you know, uh, there is a kind of uh, belief that if you dispense hearing aids, you sell, right? Sure. I believe when you dispense hearing aids, you treat people's hearing loss. And so, um, you know, uh, it's the difference just becomes uh, the remunerative environment, right? In other words, you know, if your primary care doctor prescribes to you, um, high blood pressure medicine, the remunerative model is different, but it's still somebody in quotes selling you a, a type of um, treatment. That's a great point. Right. And so, you know, uh, it, it, you know, it's that counseling and getting people, you know, because in some ways you could look at it as a difference, right? Like, so um, we can all go to Home Depot and we can all buy buckets of paint and we can all self-applicate. So that might be OTC. Some people might choose to hire a painter who goes and picks the paint out and applies it for you. And that's hiring a painter. And so there's a, there, there's really a different model in terms of getting what you want to get done, how you want to get done and what the price point is of getting it done. I would posit to you, even though I painted a decent amount in my life, a professional painter is going to do a better job than I am. And I think that's absolutely right. And that's such a great metaphor as well. Um, and I think that's really applicable to OTC, which is why it's so important to encourage people to have that on-ramp to the prescription hearing aids as they need them, as well as to that on-ramp to the oral rehabilitation piece. Right. I mean, I guess it, it, it depends what you mean by on-ramp, right? So I'm not sure whether or not, you know, so people who paint, who come and paint your home, they don't tell you, well, let me help you go get the paint at Home Depot. They just say, you can go get the paint at Home Depot, have at it. And if you want my services, come my way. So that, that'll be an interesting thing because I know some people who do prescriptive hearing aids are kind of doing OTCs as well. Um, it'll be interesting to see if that really makes sense as a differentiator. Yeah. And I suppose that's what I sort of mean by the on-ramp is this idea that you know, you, you say you get your feet wet or you dip your toes in with the OTC and you decide for whatever reason it's not right, but you don't want to give up on hearing aids altogether. You'd like to try something different. And that's when you say, well, maybe I need the person to paint my house because I'm sure just not getting the corners right or, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my big concern, though, is, 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 is people who have poor performance with OTCs and use that as a justification to never treat their hearing loss. And so that's a kind of an, that'll be an interesting thing to see how that, you know, cooks out or how that all pans out. Yeah, definitely. Well, what my hope is, is that there's enough product options available at a variety of different price points that they can kind of see where their risk tolerance is as a function of price uh, for benefit. So the idea being that like, if people don't perceive the benefit, well, maybe just having a tiny bit of benefit for a small price is better than having more benefit for more price. And we'll see, you're right. If this is something that's going to be born out in the market. Yeah, that'll be interesting, though. I mean, I guess it depends what you consider success, right? And mm -hmm. so, um, by example, um, it is not considered in medicine. If I give you a, an anti-high blood pressure medicine and, and your blood pressure is now 160 over 90, that would not be considered success. And so I wonder if the concept is you hear less bad, I'm not sure we should actually uh, consider that success, especially if there's an associated risk of dementia, you actually should get to whatever the best rehabilitative option is possible if we're trying to decrease the impact of dementia. And so that's such might... a good point. Yeah. Well, because the, the idea is like, if we're trying to influence the public policy and public health outcomes, I mean, that's where you'd want to focus. So for sure, you'd want to define that first. And I think where the FDA is, is kind of trying to put the stable stakes are like the access piece alone, you know, and, and sort of peripherally affordability. But what we're seeing is actually a lot of these OTCs are not that much cheaper than doing the prescription route. So people are asking that question, why not just go to the provider? Right? No, well, I mean, I think, right. So I mean, it's actually kind of interesting in another division of um, uh, the FDA, there's certain, like, so there are very safe and efficacious high blood pressure medicines that have been around since the 50s. But interestingly, they are not over the counter, 
right? That and so yeah. some of that has to do with the disease process, right? As compared to perhaps allergies where they are over the counter. And so, you know, what is the health criteria? And so if you are trying to mitigate risk of comorbidities of hearing loss, then you actually need to have ensure that the hearing loss is treated. And so suboptimal treatment where, you know, you hear less bad is kind of an interesting, I, I actually think it's a quagmire from a public policy and an implementation point of view, right? Less bad hearing Definitely. is early what we aspire to. That's right. Well, and you've got, you're going to have people with a variety of the disease conditions as well. Certain people, for example, might say, well, I have tinnitus that's debilitating. And yeah, I got some hearing loss too, but I just really care about the tinnitus. And so they're hearing less bad in that sense. They are really not treating the hearing loss per se, but they're doing what they're choosing kind of the a la carte for their symptom. And I agree with you. I think there's, there's some work that could be done on the public policy side to help encourage people to get those best practice public policy outcomes. Well, I think that evidence of the comorbidities has to evolve too, right? In other sure. words, compelling evidence, not that it's not, but more compelling, evidence, which is kind of interesting. You know, um, if you look at medicine, uh, so high blood pressure is a great example. Um, medicine started treating hi hypertension or high blood pressure in the 1950s. And the evidence showing that decreasing the high blood pressure mitigated the risk of heart attack was uh, came out in the early 1970s. And so um, there are many things we do in medicine before we actually have the outcome uh, data to demonstrate that. So it's kind of, I don't know what the thresholds will be in terms of the power of the study to show the morbidity, uh, the, the morbidity secondary to hearing loss. So it'll, it'll be fascinating in the next five to 10 years. It's really fascinating. I think to your point, you know, even the example you gave about um, dementia and hearing loss as they're related to each other. You know, even the literature on that, even this year is coming much more strong where at the end of last year, people were really questioning that even, you know, in the, you know, in the side of getting products cleared for the market and, you know, they look at claims and so on. Well, and they're, they're questioning it because perhaps it's commonsensical, but you might not have the study that demonstrates it, right? Sure. Absolutely. And we've known that problem for decades. It's just now somebody is, you know, putting the chops to the data to demonstrate it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what is the particular cause cognitive load versus social isolation? It's probably a little bit of both, but you know, in the end, you'd be hard pressed to argue somebody with hearing loss, getting their hearing loss treated appropriately is a good thing. So you're not going to do harm to them. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, so. that's right. And I think that's one of the things uh, that maybe was a little bit overblown in the lead up to the OTC final rule was this perception that there's going to be tons of harm that's um, given to society writ large as a result of over-the-counter hearing aids. And I think perhaps it, it could happen, but I think it's more likely to be the example you gave where people are just tolerating bad fittings as opposed to people are blowing their eardrums out with intent, excessive sound pressure level. Right, but I would argue to you poor fittings in OTCs and poor fittings in prescriptive Hearing aids are uh, a widespread, uh, the, the, I can't say for OTCs, but in prescriptive hearing aids is a huge problem in and of itself. Well, and to your point, I mean, if it's a problem in, in prescription hearing aids, the OTCs, a lot of them are just going to follow that same approach, just going right. to change the labeling intended use. So perhaps it's it's also, it's, it's likely to be a problem there as well. Well, I mean, ideally, not everybody has factory settings, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's about right. Well, and, and you know, the FDA, I can say to the, to the audience here that they are very serious when they review this stuff. I mean, they are willing to challenge not only the outcome measures of your clinical data, but also the response scale and the validation of your, your, um, your harvested patient response outcome instrument. You know, so let's say you did a, a you said, how, how do you like your hearing aid fitting on a scale of one to five? You better be ready to validate and prove that you have statistical evidence to show that your instrument is uh, valid and generalizable. I mean, so they're they're not just going to let stuff get get through on this. Well, that's an interesting model, though. Um, why is patient satisfaction a measure of outcome? It's a good question. Perhaps for the sales end goal. Is, no, is but I mean, so what's the patient satisfaction of being normotensive, right? So yeah. if your blood pressure is 120 over 80, what's the satisfaction level? I mean, actually, people tolerate side effects from the medicines to get there, right? So it's really mitigation of risk, right? So you want to be normotensive to decrease your risk of heart attack and stroke. And so if you want to be mitigate your risk of dementia, for instance, you need to be prescriptive, right? If that makes sure. sense. And so it's kind of an interesting concept. I don't get a perceptual patient perception as a criteria for treatment of disease, but that's a bigger conversation. So it's a kind of an interesting paradigmatic approach. It's a really important conversation too, because I think a lot of the data that's coming out is at least to some extent using 
patient perceptual data, exactly your point, to reinforce the mitigation of the disease process, which may be inappropriate, as you allude well, to. That's a social approach. In other words, a social awareness approach to hearing loss, which to me, I mean, I've had people with significant hearing losses who look at me and say they don't have one. Yes. Yeah. Your perception, and we know that the surveys don't correlate with, with audiogram, right? In other words, mm -hmm. so social perception of your hearing loss doesn't correlate with your actual audiogram. So it's kind of a fascinating concept. It'd be kind of like, asking somebody with high blood pressure, do you feel like your blood pressure is high? Oh yeah, you do. Okay, well then let's give you a pill. You don't feel like it's high? Okay, let's not. But interestingly, we do do an audiogram, which is an objective measure of hearing loss. And so I think one of the problems is we are all stuck in a social perception concept of hearing loss rather than a actual prescriptive prescription. Like you have a hearing loss, you need to treat it. Whether or not you perceive it doesn't matter. That's really interesting. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see where that all goes. So, well, this has been a, a great conversation, David. I ask everybody, what, what's your, I mean, especially you, you went to uh, Berkeley, did all this stuff, you've been around. So what is your favorite sound? My favorite sound? My yeah. goodness. I, I have a very specific answer for that. Right. Um, so, you know, in my spare time and, you know, as a result of studying, you know, all kinds of music and being a musician for many years, one of the things I just love to do is to, I call it blending cultural influences. So it's like, uh, you know, mixing records, like turntables and whatever, or, you know, you might do it digitally, but this, the, my favorite sound is when you've got two separate pieces of program material and you combine them to make something new. Yeah. I just, I love that. And it kind of speaks to this whole presence of, uh, you ever heard when people say classical music makes you smarter or you smell right. flowers. Make you... So like actually deconstructing that was something I, I was really interested in years past. And what we're finding or what we found in the, um, the, the neurophysiological correlates are like, if you can produce a slow moving sound and then have different rates of modulation layered on, and it gives you that same effect. And yeah. classical music just naturally does that, but. Right. It's part of, it's intrinsic to classical music. Yeah. And so for me, that's my favorite sound is combining like two different, um, you know, songs or, or sounds or mix master. You're, you're, you're mixing some music. Yeah. It's like real time arranging is almost like what I tell people. <laughs> well, which is kind of what some DJs do. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah. And then, you know, if I'm being honest, I, I, that's what, something I like to do when I'm not working is to you know, uh, DJ. And, you know, the, the whole, you know, that, that's been a big part of rap music, right? Is sure. So, mixing. So that's kind of, that's great. Well, this has been great. If people want to get a hold of you, um, how would they get a hold of you? Yeah, so probably my socials are the best way to do that. Um, you know, I'm on LinkedIn, and uh, that's probably the best one for professional interactions. Just send me a message, or um, you can contact me through there. Um, I don't really use a lot of the other ones, like Twitter or anything, um, but I, I do use LinkedIn, so maybe that's the best one. So again, everybody, this is uh, Dr. David Akbari. Um, you know, he's do, do a, working on the uh, uh, standards for prescriptive hearing aids, uh, the ANSI standards, and he's also the head of audiology at Intracon. Um, and so if you want to reach out, have any questions for him, uh, you know, he's been generous with his time with us, and I'm sure he'll uh, answer or connect with you. Uh, David, this has been a really great discussion, and uh, I really appreciate your input and look forward to seeing what you do, uh, you know, with uh, the standards. I've been on standards committees. It's, it's, a, it's a long process, um, but it's usually worth uh, the outcome at the end, but it's a wonderful thing that you're doing, and the other work that you're doing is excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Sims, and it's just so great to be with you. All right. Thanks for coming on. This has been great. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.